point of order about the quorum in the House. It's not chastising members, but I do want to remind members again that it is up to every um, every parliamentarian in this House to ensure that they respect the rules of order in the House to, to ensure that the House can flow properly. Uh, the Honourable Member, the, another point of order, the Honourable Member uh, Cumberland Colchester. Okay, you two sit. What the Premier of done? Nova Scotia called this carbon tax hike. I would like to table documents and need to seek unanimous consent to table this document, which the Premier is clear. I'm afraid I'm, I, there's been many indications that the Honourable Member doesn't have unanimous consent to present that. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Echemins, Les on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, during question period, the Minister of Procurement discussed housing. With unanimous consent, I would like to inform the House that there is a problem in Laval where rents are over $500 despite cockroach, mold, and mouse infestations. And yet people are seeing substantial increases in rent in this dilapidated housing. So with unanimous consent, I'd like to table this article. I was about to ask the House, but I hear a nay. The Honourable Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Speaker, following question period today and some of the exchanges regarding the carbon tax and the news that Western University's food bank has seen a 600 per cent increase in its usage and a 40 per cent of all post secondary students. I've already uh, indicated that there will be no uh, unanimous consent on this point. Uh, before we continue with a number of points of orders which are being raised, I would like to ask members, uh, if at all possible, to making sure that we uh, use the time of the House very efficiently, that if members are seeking unanimous consent, that they do attempt uh, to negotiate that in advance uh, with the House leaderships from the different parties so that we can make sure that we use the time efficiently. The Honourable Member from uh, Barry Springwater, Oro Madate. Put out a statement said that people across Canada are hurting right now from the high cost of living. The federal government needs to put a stop to the carbon. Unfortunately, the uh, member does not have unanimous consent to present that document. And the House Honourable Member from Thornhill. During a uh, question period, the member from Pickering was talking about how great Canadians have it because of their government. But I just want a reminder that 40% uh, of, of, uh, of an increase in. So, so unfortunately, the Honourable Member, uh, who is a uh, is a, a very uh, incredibly a capable member understands <laughs> that that is a, a point of debate. Uh, the Honourable Member from uh, Calgary, uh, uh, Rocky Ridge. Well, thanks, Mr. Speaker. I'll be brief. Uh, up to 50 military families from CFB Gagetown are using the local food bank every month. Despite that, the carbon tax is... This is a, a similar point that was raised by the Honourable Member from, uh, from Thornhill, so I'm afraid we're entering into debate. The Honourable Member from Central Okanagan, Similkanin, Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And during debate today, there was multiple references to my great province of British Columbia. I would ask for unanimous consent to table this letter from the... I thank the Honourable Member for immediately getting to the question of asking for unanimous consent. Unfortunately, there is no unanimous consent for this. The Honourable Member from uh, New Brunswick Southwest. Thank you. The New Brunswick Premier has written the Prime Minister calling on him to cancel the carbon tax. I seek you see to table this letter. I also appreciate the Honourable Member asking and, and uh, at the front end of this question seeking unanimous consent, but unfortunately there is not unanimous consent for this. The Honourable Member from Mission Massey, uh, Fraser Canyon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On a more serious matter, the member from Cambridge, in responding to a question from the Bloc Québécois on the status of small businesses, failed to note that business insolvencies are up 41 percent. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent. So, uh, I, th I thank the honourable member uh, for seeking unanimous consent, but there is none to be offered. Again, I do hope that the honourable member has made some attempt uh, to seek unanimous consent. The honourable member from Calgary, Amidnapur. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'll just wait for everyone on intelligent TL debate. Um, but previous to that, I would just like to point out, uh, you know, we heard definite concern from the member for Milton about Alberta. Uh, in addition to, um, I haven't even said anything. Yeah. I, I, I would. It's, it, 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 it's not. A, it's, it is. 
initial, it's always in everybody's interest, and I say this to all members and quite sincerely, um, if you want to raise a point of order, I, I do recommend that you get straight to the point of, to what point of order you want to bring up, because otherwise, uh, when we hear the uh, premise and the introduction, it's often getting into debate and, and forces the chair to, to say that that is a matter of debate, as opposed to either seeking unanimous consent or raising a point of order. So the Honourable Member either raises a, a point of, uh, of order or seeks unanimous consent right away. The Honourable Member, member from Milford. Calgary, uh, mid uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Where he mentioned... Um, Premier Smith, and I also have some comments regarding Premier Smith, that she is also encouraging this government to get rid of this 23 per cent carbon tax. So, so this, is, this is definitely a... So the Honourable Member, I'll invite the Honourable Member to please to sit down. I'll ask... I'll invite the Honourable Member to please take her spot, because this is clearly a point of... Clearly a point of debate. Burnaby as a New Westminster Burnaby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just to remind uh, members of this House, it cost $80,000 to run this House for an hour. So the Conservatives' filibuster has cost $20,000 to Canadians. I, I do thank the Honourable Member. I do thank the Honourable Member from New Westminster Burnaby to, in reminding the House in terms of the, the, all the expenses which are required when we don't take the opportunity to negotiate these things in advance. I do ask members to do this. I see that the member uh, from uh, Central... Uh, uh, Coast of Bays. Coast of Bays Central, uh, not Notre Dame, is rising on his feet. Uh, but I, I do hope that the member will either raise a point of order uh, that he wants to quote or gets immediately to the request for a unanimous consent. The Honourable Member. Point of order, Mr. Speaker, and I think we'll have consent to uh, for me to table this letter that was written by. So the I, 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 I regret. I regret. I regret to the honourable member from Central. From, I, the honourable. The honourable member is a is a reasonable man. I'll ask him. Please, he knows that the speaker stands up. That the speaker should. Sit, that the member should sit down. Um, the, the member from uh, Costa Bay Central Notre Dame does not have unanimous consent to present that point. No, I'm a member from Prince George Caribou. Caribou Prince George. Caribou Mr. Prince George. Far be it for me to uh, correct you. Mr. Speaker, on page 75 of the, the most current BC budget, it does say that our province of British Columbia is federally mandated to implement the carbon tax. Yes. Therefore, I would like to. So I, I, th I thank the honourable member for getting to the point of unanimous consent. It was clear that there is no unanimous consent for that order. Daily routine of business, tabling of documents. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to table in both official languages information we've received regarding the Public Service Commission of Canada's annual reports from 2020 to 2022 23 The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Women and Gender Equality and Youth. I have the honour to table in both official languages the government's responses to 80 petitions. These returns will be tabled in an electronic format. Introduction of government bills. Statements by ministers. Reports from interparliamentary delegations. Presenting reports from committees. The honourable honourable member from Kingston and the Islands. No, I'm trying to. I'm sure she's online. Member from Halifax West. M Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have the honour to present in both official languages. The Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights in relation to Bill C-332, an act to amend the criminal code controlling or coercive conduct. Le comité a été the committee has studied the bill and decided to report it back to the House with amendments. Thank you. The Honourable Member from New Brunswick Southwest. Mr. Speaker, I have the honour to present in both official languages the 37th report of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts in relation to the motion adopted on Wednesday, March 6, 2024, 
regarding Report 1, Arrive Can, of the 2024 Reports of the Auditor General of Canada. That motion reads, the Committee shall report to the House that it calls on the Government to prohibit any Government employees from simultaneously working as an external contractor. Mr. Speaker, I also have the honour to present in both official languages the 38th report of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts in relation to the motion adopted on Wednesday, March 6, 2024, regarding Report 1, Arrive Can, of the 2024 reports of the Auditor General of Canada. And that motion reads that the Committee invites the President of the Treasury Board, Anita Anand, to appear for no less than two hours in relation to the Arrive Can study, and that this meeting occur within three weeks of this motion being adopted. Thank you. Introduction of private members' bills. Mr. Doherty, seconded by Mr. Majumdar, moves for leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting the Establishment and Award of a Special Service Medal for Domestic Emergency Relief Operations. This motion is deemed adopted. The Honourable Member from Caribou, Prince George. Mr. Speaker, I'm honoured to rise today and table my new private member's bill on Act Respecting the Establishment and Award of a Special Service Medal for Domestic and Emergency Relief Operations. Mr. Speaker, this bill would establish a service uh, medal for Canadian Forces members, RCMP, firefighters and first responders who participate in domestic emergencies like wildfires and floods. Military personnel, RCMP, firefighters and first responders are on the front lines each and every day. They are our heroes who wake up with the knowledge that when they go to work, they may not come home. Real heroes don't wear capes, Mr. Speaker. They wear arm patches that say firefighter, RCMP, uh, Canadian Armed Forces. They protect us. They care for us when we need help. And they are our silent sentinels that protect all of us. They put their lives at risk to protect can Canada and Canadians both in their normal duties and domestic emergency relief operations. Their bravery and sacrifice should be recognized and rewarded with the highest honours. Thank you, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here. Mr. Doherty, seconded by Mr. Majumdar, moves that the bill be now read a first time and be printed. This motion is deemed adopted. First reading of this bill, première lecture de ce projet de loi. Will this bill be read a second time at the next sitting of the House? First reading of Senate public bills. Motions. Presenting petitions. The Honourable Member uh, from... Give me just, <laughs> it's coastal, that's it's the first word that I always remember. Coastal Bay, Central Notre Dame. A petition in this House today to expand the food fishery for cod in Newfoundland and Labrador so that it will allow for the retention of codfish for, uh, for every, on every day from July 1st to October 1st of each year. Uh, the petition had 3,945 people who signed it and, um, and those and, their, and, and also the sponsor of the petition, uh, Mr. Graham Wood of uh, Lewisport call on the Minister of Fisheries to announce the dates and regulations for the food fishery by May 1st every year instead of near the end of June as been the uh, NDP Liberal tradition. Uh, the three-day weekend food fishery, Mr. Speaker, uh, represents a safety issue for those who take part and it also puts extra strain on DFO conservation and protection resources as well as the 103 rescue squadron in Gander. Um, we feel, or the, the, the folks who, who uh, signed this petition, petition feel that it will lead to uh, less pressure on the codfish uh, resource and less cod taken because it takes away the, um, the rush. Everyone wants to get out on those three-day weekends. Now people will procrastinate and they'll wait and wait and wait and they'll put it off which will lead to less fish being taken. Uh, the FFAW opposed the petition because they think it will lead to more fish being taken, but uh, the FFAW has bigger fish to fry, and I have their back, and I'll support them in, in many ways. Just, just, just try to remind members uh, that when they're presenting petitions, they shouldn't indicate whether or not they're for or against, uh, just to present the petition. Uh, they're not to present a for or against or express an opinion on the petition. Uh, so. So this is a common sense petition, which I support. Again, I, I, I just uh, indicate to the honourable member uh, from Costa Bay Central, Notre Dame, that you shouldn't be uh, making a reference on this. So I'll, 
I'll ask the honourable member uh, to wrap up very quickly, and then so there are a number of other petitions that need to be presented today. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Speaker, for straightening me out and um, and for the opportunity to present this petition on behalf of the nearly 4,000 people of Newfoundland and Labrador that signed it in 30 days. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you, honourable member. The honourable member from Peace uh, Peace River Westlock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, it's my privilege to rise today to present a petition from Canadians from across the country, uh, including many of my own constituents who are concerned about the consent and age verification of those depicted in pornographic material. Uh, the petitioners ask for the government to follow recommendation number two of the 2021 Standing Committee on Access to Information, Privacy and Ethics report on MindGeek, uh, which requires the, that all c content hosting platforms in Canada verify age and consent prior to uploading content uh, on a commercial, uh, on, a, on platforms that operate for a com on a commercial basis. Uh, Bill C-270, the Stopping Internet Sexual Exploitation Act, adds two offenses to the criminal code. Uh, the first requires age verification and consent prior to distribution, and the second requires the removal of that material if consent is withdrawn. As such, the petitioners are calling on the quick passage of, of Bill S or C-270, the Stopping Internet Sexual Exploitation Act. You support Thank it, you. right? Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. The Honourable Member from uh, Cowich and uh, Malahat Langford. Very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today to table a petition to the Government of Canada where the petitioners recognize that although it has been many years since the first use of nuclear weapons have demonstrated their awesome powers, we remain today under the constant threat of warfare that could result in devastation from which the world will never recover. Uh, the petitioners also recognize that the Government of Canada has published statements saying we are committed to achieving a world free of nuclear weapons. They recognize that Canada, as a member of the UN Conference on Disarmament and the Stockholm Initiative for Nuclear Disarmament, has an obligation to promote internationally the elimination of nuclear weapons. They also recognize that the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons has been signed by 86 countries and ratified by 66 but not by Canada. And they also recognize, finally, Mr. Speaker, that as a non-nuclear state, Canada is in the best position to comply with the articles of the TPNW and to guide its allies and other nations towards a world free from nuclear weapons. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, these petitioners call on the Government of Canada to sign and commit to ratifying the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and to urge allies and other nations to follow suit. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Senate to Gulf Islands. Speaker, I'd like to present two petitions this morning, so I'll do so as quickly as possible. They're both of critical concern to members of my constituency. I had the honour to host uh, 12 community meetings uh, recently in different parts of the riding. There wasn't a single meeting where the issue of the crisis of access to family doctors wasn't raised. So I put forward this petition, Mr. Speaker. Petitioners note that according to Statistics Canada, approximately 4.8 million Canadians do not have a regular doctor, that 92 per cent of physicians are working in urban centres and just 8 per cent in rural areas. Uh, that in Victoria and Sydney, BC, uh, within Saanich Gulf Islands, average wait times for a walk-in clinic are 92 and 180 minutes, respectively. The petitioners call on the government to work with the provinces and territories to come to a holistic and fair solution to deal with the family, doctor, health care provider shortage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Moving to my second petition, which deals with the critical habitat requirements of the rare and threatened bird, uh, the marbled murrelet. This bird nests in the roots of old growth forests. That's the only place where it is found, although it spends most of its lifetime out on the open ocean. The petitioners are calling for the government of Canada to immediately protect all of the critical old growth habitat that is of needed or that's totally needed by the marbled murrelets and that recognizing that this habitat is also uh, uh, protected under the Migratory Birds Convention Act to which Canada is uh, a signatory. This, this matter is urgent. The number of birds is down to precious few. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
And before I continue with petitions, I'd just like to inform members that we have a fair number of uh, people who would like to present petitions. I'm going to ask them to be quite brief because uh, I know people would like to get this in before uh, the Easter break. The Honourable Member from uh, Ottawa Centre. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. Uh, I'm uh, bringing forward this petition on behalf of my constituency in Ottawa Ca Centre. Um, it uh, recognizes that there is a grave humanitarian crisis that's taking place in Gaza because of the, the war that's taking uh, place there. Uh, it, it acknowledges that Canada is recognized uh, for its historical leadership in humanitarian actions in the global uh, community. Uh, it also recognizes the fact that Canada really stepped forward in helping Ukrainians to come on a temporary basis to Canada uh, to flee from the wa war and asking uh, similar action in order to extend the same special immigration measures that were granted to Ukrainian nationals, to Palestinians also, and to allow Palestinians in Gaza to apply for the special immigration uh, measure so that they can uh, be able to come here and, be, and work while that, uh, the war uh, comes to an end in Gaza. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Fleetwood, Port Kells. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have uh, two certified petitions pursuant to Standing Order 36. The first recognizes long wait times and inconsistent standards of service delivery, uh, which have a significant negative impact on the physical and mental well-being of Canadian Armed Forces veterans and current and former members of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And the petitioners ask that the Minister of Veterans Affairs commit to remedying the situation that has been allowed to exist for too long. The second uh, petition that I have uh, harmonizes with the work that was done at the Fisheries and Oceans Standing Committee. Uh, and basically, the, uh, the undersigned citizens of Canada call on the Minister of Fisheries, Oceans and the Canadian Coast Guard to immediately prohibit any transfer of commercial fishing licenses and quotas to foreign interests or beneficial owners who are not Canadian. Thank you. Honourable Member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will be brief. I have three petitions. The first is with respect to um, environmentalists uh, from throughout uh, the country who are calling upon the Government of Canada to move forward immediately with bold emissions caps for the oil and gas sector that are comprehensive in scope and realistic in achieving our targets um, as set out for 2030. The second petition that I have is a petition from um, the, uh, my community, in particular residents of the Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox and Addington region, who are calling upon the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development and the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food to prioritize a national school food program through Budget 2024 for the implementation of, of the fall of 2024. And, uh, they specifically draw to the attention of the government that Canada is the only G7 country without a national school food program. And finally, the third petition I have, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, comes from actually the majority of the residents are from the uh, riding uh, to the north of me, Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. These are residents who um, are drawing to the attention of the fact that at a federal institution, the Joyceville Institution, the abattoir uh, has been closed for about two years. They indicate that beef farmers uh, are now waiting up to six to nine months, in many cases, uh, up to a year to advance to have their cattle processed at this uh, facility or at other facilities. The abattoir located at Joyceville Institution on Highway 15 in Ontario closed in September of 2022, and the closure has put even more strain on processing abattoirs, negatively impacting the process uh, for wait times. Um, and they also highlight the, econo the negative economic impacts as a result of uh, this abattoir closing. Therefore, they're calling upon the Government of Canada uh, to explore all options to ensure the abattoir located at Joyceville Institution is reopened to address the issues noted above. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from St. Albert, Edmonton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise to present a petition signed by Canadians. As it stands, convicted murderers are eligible to apply for parole annually after serving their minimum sentence. The petitioners observe that such frequent parole hearings re-traumatize the families of murder victims. Uh, the bill that the petitioners are urging Parliament to pass is Bill S-281, known as Brian's Bill, named in honor of Brian Olisic, who was murdered at the University of Alberta. He and three of his colleagues were shot point-blank in the back of the head. The bill would amend the Corrections and Conditional Release Act such that convicted murderers would only be eligible to apply at the time of their automatic review. 
Petitions. First reading, sorry, excuse me, a questions on the order paper. The Honourable Member from Hamilton Mountain. Mr. Speaker, the following questions will be answered today. Q2265, 2267, 2269, 2272, 2273, and 2278. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, if the government's responses to question number Q2266, 2268, 2270, 2271 and 2274 to 2277 could be made orders for return. These returns would be tabled in an electronic format immediately. <laughs> All du jour, orders of the day. Oh, sorry, excuse me, I forgot to do, before we get to orders of the day, I with, humbly with, with, withdraw that comment. Is it the pleasure of the House that the aforementioned questions be made orders for return and that they be tabled immediately? Yes. Agreed and so ordered. Orders of the day. Oh, um, um. Finally, Mr. Speaker, Madam. I ask that the remaining questions be allowed to stand. Agreed and so ordered. Orders of the day. Government Orders, Government Bills Commons, resuming debate at second reading of Bill C-38, an act to amend the Indian Act, new registration entitlements. A point of order, the Honourable Member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm rising to respond to uh, questions of privilege. Um, and I have some comments here, and I uh, appreciate the House's uh, um, uh, acceptance to allow me to introduce those now to contribute to the previous question of privilege uh, um, that has been raised here. And this is specifically in response to two questions of privilege raised on March the 20th, 2024. The first matter was raised by the member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes respecting the 17th report on the Standing Committee of Government Operations, and the second concerns the deliberations uh, on an NDP Opposition Day motion considered on March 18, 2024. The matter raised by the member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, Rideau Lakes concerns a potential breach of privilege concerning witnesses' testimony at a standing committee on government operations in its study of the Arrive Can application. As the member notes, the committee unanimously agreed to adopt a motion to present a report to the House outlining the potential breach of privilege concerning Kirsten Firth's uh, refusal to answer questions from committee members and uh, his uh, um, inability his and in answering those questions. If the Speaker finds that this is a prima facie question of privilege, the government supports sending this matter to the Procedure and House Affairs Committee for study. The standard modern practice of dealing with breaches of privilege of the House or individual members has to be to move a motion to refer a matter to the Procedure and House Affairs Committee. In the case of a contempt, uh, the most recent example, which was cited by the member, was to summon the individual to the bar of the House of Commons for reprimand. These, two, these are two avenues that have been pursued uh, by the House for the last hundred years. As the chamber that is based on practice and procedure, these are the two most well-characterized ways of dealing with such affronts to privileges of the House and its members. I suggest that there is nothing with the current situation that suggests that we now take a different approach. I also find it somewhat bizarre that the only uh, precedence that the member used to try and make his case uh, for his proposed motion dates back hundreds of years. I would submit to the House that times have changed since the 19th century England and so have the rules and practices of this House. On March the 21st, 2024, the member from Beauport Lemieux in intervened on the matter and concluded that a prima facie question of privilege be found that the member had referred to the Procedure and House Affairs Committee. I agree with the member on both points. The Procedure and House Affairs Committee is the appropriate committee to which this matter should be referred. Page 966 on the third edition of Procedure and Practices states in uh, relation to specific matters, uh, to, sorry, in relation to specific mandate of Procedure and House Affairs Committee, and I quote, the Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs deals with the reviewing of standing orders, procedure, and house practices in the Commons and its committees, end of quote. The footnote attached to the quote states, and I quote, should the Speaker find a prima facie grounds, it is established practice of the House to refer matters of privilege to the committee for further study. In his ruling on March the 9th, 2011, Speaker Milliken reminded the House of this practice, 
end quote. I would like to refer to the ruling of Speaker Milliken on March the 9th, 2011, in which he states, and I quote, before I invite the member from King Hans to move his motion, however, the chair wishes to explain the procedural parameters that govern such motions. House of Commons Procedure and Practice, second edition on pages 146 and 147 state, in cases where the motion is not known in advance, the speaker may provide assistance to the member if the member uh, sorry, uh, to the member if the terms or the proposed motion are substantially different from the matter originally raised. The Speaker would be reluctant to allow a matter as important as privilege motion to fail on the grounds of improper form. These terms of the motion have generally provided that the matter be referred to committee for study and have been amended to that effect. I hasten to add to the powers of the, uh, of the Speaker in these matters are robust and well known. In 1966, Speaker Lamaru, uh, having come to find a prima facie question of privilege on a matter, ruled on a number of motions out of order. As, uh, as House of Commons Procedure and Practice, second edition, tells us at page 147, footnote 371, in doing so, Mr. Lamaru, quote, uh, Mr. Lamaru said, uh, quote, uh, more than once pointed out that the, that the Canadian practice to refer such matters to the committee for study and suggested that this would be the avenue pursued. The chair is, of course, aware of the expectations to this practice, but in most, if not all, of these cases, circumstances were such that a deviation from the normal practice was deemed acceptable or there was a unanimous desire on the part of the House to proceed in that fashion." End of quote. In cases of contempt, a similar approach has been taken and is supported by precedent for the past 100, 100 years. The most recent example is the Speaker's ruling on June the 16th of 2021 with respect to the alleged non-compliance with, with an order of the House. The Speaker ruled in this case, and I quote, as as a result of the opinion, uh, as, a, as a result in the opinion of the chair, the failure to comply with the order of the House on June 2, 2nd, 2021, constitutes a prima facie question of privilege. There is one last point to settle. The chair has read the wording of the motion suggested by the member from Louis Saint Laurent uh, in his written notice. It departs considerably from written established practice. The scope of this type of motion is limited, as indicated in the House. Uh, of Commons Procedure and Practices, third edition at page 150, and I, and I quote, the terms of the motion have generally provided that the matter be referred to committee for study. Uh, as, uh, end quote. As a, as a review, uh, uh, sorry, a, a review of the rare exceptions shows that there, shows that there was certain cons uh, consensus on the procedure to on the procedure to follow and thus on the wording of the motion. There are precedents that support censure. In short, given the parameters for such motions are clear and the practice is well established, the proposed motion should be a motion of censure or to refer the matter to the appropriate committee for study, end of quote. Even if it were procedurally um, admissible uh, or if there was a unanimous consent to have these witnesses appear before the bar to be questioned, it is unlikely to yield a different result. Then the only recourse for the House to take the mat to take for the House to take in the matter would be to censure the individual, as in the situation described in Speaker's ruling of June the 16th, 2021. The Conservatives are trying to set up, uh, set, up, set up a new trend. We think that before proceeding with calling uh, the individuals to the bar, and certainly before we start t talking about questioning witnesses at the bar, which has not even been contemplated in more than 200 years, that the matter should be referred to PROC so that they may firstly review the evidence and make recommendations on procedures, safeguards and criteria for calling and questioning individuals before the bar. This is a very serious serious matter and we cannot operate on an ad hoc basis. We need some clarity on how we should proceed. The House is therefore faced with two well-established options in my opinion. To refer the matter to the Procedure and House Affairs Committee or to summon this individual to the bar for censure. That is for the Speaker to choose and the House to decide upon. The second matter relates to the deliberation on the NDP Opposition Day motion that took place on Monday, March 18, 2024. The member from Portneuf, Jacques Cartier, alleges that his privileges were breached when the Government House Leader moved an amendment to the motion during the debate and the translation delays prevented members from considering the amendment in French. 
I submit that there are two matters to be considered in this case. The first is that the events that took place on Monday, March 18th, and the member raised uh, and the member raised the argument two days later. This was not the first opportunity to raise the matter. Secondly, the fact that the evidence, the, the, the fact that the events of, Mar of the debate of March 18th simply do not support the allegation raised by the member. The member did not raise his question of privilege at the first opportunity as required. Page 145 of the third edition of the House of Commons Procedure and Practices states, and I quote, the matter of privilege is to be raised in the House must have recently occurred and must call for the immediate action of the House. Therefore, the member must satisfy the Speaker that he or she is bringing the matter to the attention of the House as soon as practic uh, practical uh, after uh, becoming aware of the situation. When a member has not fulfilled this very important requirement, the Speaker has ruled that the matter is not a prima facie question of privilege. End of quote. There was no requirement for the member to have time to marshal sophisticated arguments to substantiate. Sorry, there was uh, no requirement for the member to have time to marshal sophisticated arguments or substantive or substantiate his allegation. If I were to speculate, the member either did not take the matter seriously or was waiting to raise the argument on Wednesday for the simple objective of disrupting proceedings related to the consideration of Bill C-29 on that day. There is no procedural limitation on when an amendment may be proposed to a motion uh, before the House while it is under consideration. The House was under government orders when the amendment was proposed. It is a well-established practice that amendments may be moved in either official language. Citation 552, subsection 3 of the 6th edition of Bashane's um, Parliamentary Rules uh, and Forms address this matter, and I quote, every motion that is duly moved and seconded in, and is placed before the House by the Speaker as a question for the decision of the House, all motions must be presented to the Speaker in writing in either of the two official languages, end of quote. And I will concede that the amendment was moved later in the day, but this was the result of good faith discussions between members of Parliament that lasted until shortly before the motion was moved, which is why, the motion, why it was moved in one language. That is how the House of Commons is supposed to work. Rigorous debate and discussions to come to, and discussions to come to consensus. It is always the practice of the government to provide all parties with information in both official languages. However, in this case, it was not possible to provide a written copy in both official languages in the time provided, which is why the members of the House were provided with simultaneous, uh, 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 simultaneous interpretation of the proceedings of the House in both official languages. Thirdly, while the House was, suspend, was suspended to the call of the Chair, the table officers circulated to all parties the text of the amendment in French to ensure that members could understand what had been proposed as an amendment and what they were voting on. Finally, when the House resumed after the amendment had been made available in both official languages, the Speaker entertained additional points of order on the admissibility of the motion which would have offered the opportunity for any member to intervene on the amendment in either official language. When the Speaker put the question to the House on the amendment, it included text of the motion in French, clearly demonstrating that the text was available in both official languages. The government strongly believes in the, the importance of both official languages in, par in the Parliament of Canada. To demonstrate this, the House passed amendments to the Official Languages Act in Bill C. 13. Bill C-13 implemented a series of proposals that promote the progressive pro uh, progression towards an equality of status and use of English and French. Several provisions of the enactment are therefore con concrete illustrations of the constitutional principles set out in subsection 16.3 of the Charter. Mr. Speaker, the facts contradict the assertion by the member that he did not have access to the text of the amendment in both official languages, nor meet the test that the matter must be raised at the first opportunity. Therefore, I submit that the matter does not constitute a prima facie question of privilege. Thank you for allowing me to present all of that, Mr. Speaker. Well done. I thank the honourable member from Kingston and the Islands for uh, his uh, input on two uh, important questions which are going to be coming before the, before the chair, and the chair will uh, hasten to 
come back to the House uh, as quickly as possible with a decision at least on one of those issues. Again, orders of the day, resuming debate. Uh, we are at the point of, uh, of uh, resuming debate for Mr. Uh, sorry, the member, honourable member from Nepean, uh, who has uh, uh, 20 minutes in front of him, uh, up to 20 minutes on Bill C-38. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I stand before you to discuss a monumental step forward in our nation's journey towards reconciliation and justice for First Nation communities. The proposed legislation, Bill C-38, seeks to amend the Indian Act in response to long-standing concerns voiced by First Nations, individuals and communities, as well as to address the residual discriminatory impacts highlighted by the Nicholas versus AGC litigation. For too long, the Indian Act has been a source of division and inequality, its outdated provisions casting long shadows over the promise of e equity and unity. Bill C-38 represents a pivotal moment in our collective history, a chance to right the wrongs of the past and lay the groundwork for a future where justice and equality are not just ideals but realities. The proposed changes are both comprehensive and transformative. Firstly, the bill seeks to eliminate known sex-based membership inequalities from the Act. This is a critical step towards ensuring that all First Nation individuals, regardless of gender, have equal rights and opportunities. By addressing these sex-based inequalities, we not only uphold the principles of justice and fairness, but also honour the resilience and dignity of those who have fought tirelessly for these changes. Secondly, the legislation address, uh, aims to address inequities caused by the practice of enfranchisement. This historical practice, which stripped First Nation individuals of their status and rights, has left deep scars on communities. By rectifying this injustice, we acknowledge the wrongs of the past and take a significant step towards healing and reconciliation. Additionally, Bill C-38 will allow for deregistration from the Indian Register. This change recognizes the autonomy and agency of First Nation individuals, providing them with the freedom to define their own identities and affiliations. It is a move towards self-determination, empowering individuals to make choices that reflect their personal beliefs and circumstances. On the subject of enfranchisement, it is essential to emphasize the gravity of its impact. The process unjustly stripped thousands of First Nations individuals of their status, severing severing their ties to their communities and heritage. Although the practice was abolished 35 years ago, the shadows it casts are long and dark with its harmful legacy still felt today. The scars left by enfranchisement are not, own, not merely historical footnotes, they are lived realities for many manifesting in lost connections identities and rights. In alignment with our commitment to reconciliation and guided by the wisdom of First Nation partners, our government is dedicated to confronting and eliminating these registration inequalities at a systemic level. Bill C-38 is not just a legislative measure, it is a testament to our resolve to address this injustice head-on. By targeting these inequities, we are taking a stand against the vestiges of policies designed to assimilate and erase First Nations identities. Moreover, the Bill's commitment to eradicating sex-based discrimination in the Indian Act addresses a critical aspect of inequality that has persisted for too long. 
these discriminatory practices embedded in the legislation have undermined the principle, principle of equality and fairness. By confronting this injustice, injustice uh, Bill C-38 is setting a precedent for the kind of nation we aspire to be, one where equality is not just a principle but a practice. Let us recognize that Bill C-38 represent a step forward in our journey towards reconciliation. It is a journey that requires our collective effort, commitment, and compassion. As we move forward, let us do so with the understanding that true reconciliation involves acknowledging the past, rectifying injustice, and working towards a future where rights and dignity of all First Nation peoples are respected and upheld. Bill C-38 commits to removing outdated and offensive languages found in the Act. Language shapes our perceptions and attitudes, and by eliminating these derogatory terms, we foster a more respective and inclusive dialogue. This change is not just about updating terminology. It is about reshaping the narrative and affirming the dignity of all First Nations people. In our journey towards progress and inclusivity, we encounter a significant obstacle. Our legal code, a labyrinth of statues, some of which date back to a long time, to a previous era. Among these laws are provisions that no longer reflect our current values, ethics, and understanding. Even more concer concerning, some contain language that is offensive, discriminatory, and wholly out of step with today's standards of respect and equality. The task before us is not merely administrative. It is morally imperative. To rectify this, we must undertake a comprehensive review of our legal system. This review should not only identify outdated and offensive provisions, but also evaluate the relevance and applicability of laws in the contemporary context. The goal is not to erase history, but to ensure that our legal framework is just, equitable, and reflective of the society we aspire to be. This process requires a collaborative effort involving legal experts, historians, ethicists, and importantly, the community at large. Public consultation will ensure that the process is transparent, inclusive, and sensitive to the diverse needs and values of our society. Technology can aid in this endeavor, enabling most efficient review and broader engagement. Moreover, this effort presents an opportunity for educational outreach, helping the public understand the evolution of our legal system and the importance of our laws that are just inclusive and respectful. By engaging in this critical work, we affirm our commitment to democracy, justice, and dignity of all individuals. The bill includes further required consequential amendments to ensure that, act, that the act reflects the values of equality, respect, and justice. These changes are not merely administrative. They are a testament to our commitment to addressing historical injustice and building a more equitable society. Bill C-38 is more than just legislation. It's a beacon of hope. It signifies a profound shift in our relationship with First Nations communities. One is rooted in respect, understanding, and partnership. <laughs> As we move forward, let us do so with open hearts and minds, committed to the principles of reconciliation and equity. Together, we can build a future that honors the rich heritage and contributions of First Nation peoples, ensuring that our nation's legacy is one of unity, justice, and mutual respect. The path to modernizing our legal system <laughs> is both a challenge and an opportunity. 
an opportunity to reaffirm our reaffirm our values to strengthen our democracy and to build a more inclusive society together let us embark on this journey with determination and hope thank you mr speaker question et commentaire the honorable member from sanage call finance thank you mr speaker and i certainly remember as this bill came forward expressions of disappointment that it didn't go farther that it's relatively minor changes in the relationships between indigenous peoples and the crown and that more, much more will be needing needed to be done i didn't hear anyone suggest it wasn't a good but small good step forward i wonder if the honorable member is, can can inform us of uh, the extent to which more changes more substantial changes will be coming in the legislative scheme of this of this country's racist laws the honorable member from the pn thank you mr speaker i thank the honorable member for our question i agree that uh, much more needs to be done uh, we are taking the step in the di right directions uh, that is the most important thing we have the intention and we have already shown uh, converting our intention into reality by taking this step and but i agree with her much more needs to be done question et commentaire le honorable député de Laurentie la the honorable member for Laurentie la belle thank you mr speaker we understand that this matter of belonging is extremely important and we do need to move forward but mr speaker I'd like to ask my colleague why, after five years, when on a basic level, his government has not taken action, and now it's only acting now, and not very much. Mr. Speaker, I wish that much, 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 much more things, or many more things that we could have done, should have done, but the important thing that what we are doing it now. The Honourable Member from Central Okanagan, Simukmin Nikola. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. On the topic of C-38, I just uh, would like to ask the member that the department estimates around 3,500 individuals would be enfranchised, and that ultimately that means that any financial costs of integrating those will be put onto Indian bands. I have a question around Section 10 bands. Section 10 bands have the autonomy to determine membership uh, therefore, an individual may obtain status from the Indian Register after C-38's passage. However, Mr. Speaker, that, that is a, a leads a question that I have, is, is that whether or not uh, this will complicate the Section 10 uh, process that has been well established, uh, and does the member think that this needs to be studied further, or that some amendments or some, some clarity from the government needs to be forthcoming? The Honourable Member from the PN. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to be very honest and frank, I am not very sure exactly the specific uh, nature of the question the uh, member asked, and I don't have the answer for that, but I hopefully the government will listen to the question and provide some clarity. The Honourable Member from uh, Peace River Westlaw. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I do remember uh, back in 2019 there was a bill called S3. Uh, which I thought was the government's answer to all of these problems. Uh, would this bill, C-38, is this not an admission on behalf of the government that they didn't get it right in C-3, or in S-3? Thank you. The Honourable Member from McKeon. Uh, Mr. Speaker, many a times uh, we may not get, cover every single thing that we aim to do. Sometimes there may be uh, things that were not covered, but the important thing is that we have recognized it and we are coming out with this legislation. Seeing that there are no other questions and comments, I am now ready to rule on the question of privileged raise, privilege rather, raised on Wednesday, March 20, 2024, by the member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rio Lakes. Concerning the 17th report of the Standing Committee on Government Operations and Estimates, which was presented to the House earlier that same day. L'objet de ce rapport est lié au... The subject matter of this report is related to the Committee's 14th report which accused Mr. Christian Firth and Mr. Darren Anthony of disregarding the rights and privileges of the committee to summon them to appear as witnesses. 
the House had concurred in that report, which ordered both to appear before the committee, and both have now done so. This new report arises from concerns over the testimony that Mr. Firth furnished to the committee and his refusal to answer members' questions. Listened to the members, acquainted myself with the content of the report, and consulted the few but clear precedents. The chair finds the matter to be a prima facie question of privilege. In his intervention, the deputy house leader of the government raised concerns. Uh, sorry, the uh, parliamentary secretary to the deputy house leader of the government raised concerns about the motion that the member has indicated he will move. While it is perhaps true that the suggested remedy is not something that we have seen for some time, I am of the view that it is procedurally in order. As with the case cited from June 2021, the motion provides for a call to the bar to be reprimanded and a specific remedy to the offence. Furthermore, once proposed, the motion is subjected to the usual rules of debate and ultimately, it is for the House to decide whether it agrees with the motion as proposed. I would now invite the member from Leeds Gredville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes to move his motion. Uh, speaker, uh, I move, seconded by the member for Calgary Mindapore, that the House, having considered the unanimous views of the Standing Committee on Government Operations and Estimates expressed in its 17th report, find Christian Firth to be in contempt for his refusal to answer certain questions and for prevaricating in his answers to other questions, and accordingly order him to attend at the bar of this House at the expiry of the time provided for oral questions on the third sitting day following the adoption of this uh, order for the purposes of A, receiving an admonishment to be delivered by the Speaker, B, providing responses to the questions referred to in the 17th report, and C, responding to supplementary questions arising from his responses to the questions referred to in the 17th report. Take it. Mr. Barrett, seconded by Ms. Cousy, moves that the House, having considered the unanimous views of the Standing Committee on Government Operations and Estimates expressed in its 17th report, find Christian Firth to be in contempt for his refusal to answer certain questions and for prevaricating in his answers to other questions, and, accordingly, order him to attend at the bar of this House at the expiry of the time provided for oral questions on the third sitting day following the adoption of this order for the purposes of A, receiving an admonishment delivered by the Speaker, B, providing responses to the questions referred to in the 17th report, and C, responding to supplementary questions arising from his responses to the questions referred to in the 17th report. Debate. The Honourable Member from Leeds Grenville, uh, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Speaker, I, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to rise to speak to this important uh, motion and uh, I'm uh, and, and pleased that uh, members from all parties did offer responses uh, in the House and uh, following your, uh, your careful uh, ruling that um, we do have this opportunity to, uh, remind, uh, to remind Canadians about the important work that's done here, the important powers that we have here that allow us to do the work that we've been elected to do for Canadians. This speaker is born out of the $60 million of corruption, fraud and forgery. This was a situation that saw 10,000 Canadians falsely forced into quarantine. And well, this is what you get after eight years of, of this Prime Minister his broken arrive scam. For nearly 18 months, Conservatives have been holding 
this Prime Minister's government to account for his $60 million boondoggle. Now, this app started out with a price tag of $80,000, and through mismanagement and corruption, the price grew 750 times its original cost. We've seen a two-man basement operation like GC Strategies and Dalian make millions off of taxpayers for an app while doing no IT work. We've seen government officials wined and dined for contracts, and we've seen government officials leveling unbelievable accusations, shocking accusations of wrongdoing at each other before parliamentary committees. We know that there have been um, substantiated uh, reports of bid rigging and fraudulent and forged documents being used in order to, uh, for contractors to win government business. And there are now 12 investigations into this scandal, including by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. We've seen the institution of Parliament attacked by government officials who have lied to committee and by key players in the scandal lying and refusing <coughs> orders of parliamentary committees. Now, as is referred to in the, the reports from the Standing Committee on Government Operations, uh, we know that Christian Firth and Darren Anthony uh, did not uh, attend when summoned the first time, the second time, the third time, only under the threat <coughs> of arrest using extraordinary powers of this parliament entrusted to us by Canadians did they finally attend. But that's what brings us here today. Using uh, an extraordinary remedy to an extraordinary problem, that is ordering the appearance under threat of arrest, did we have Mr. Firth do something that hasn't given rise to the kind of debate that we're having now for, well, uh, about, a, about 110 years. It seems that this reminder is, uh, is more important uh, now than ever. We've seen varying degrees of offence, but never anything as egregious as this. And this stems from Christian Firth, the principal of GC Strategies, that two-person firm who has paid nearly $20 million on the $60 million boondoggle that is the Arrive scam, refusing to answer questions and then obstructing the work of Parliament and its committees. At the Government Operations Committee, I asked whether Mr. Firth had lied to a parliamentary committee before. He refused to answer. I also asked which public office holders Mr. Firth had met outside of government offices. He again refused to answer. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, asked Mr. Firth how many hours he spent sending LinkedIn invitations. Now, this is a key component of GC Strategy's apparent recruitment strategy, if you can believe it, what earned them uh, commissions of up to 30 per cent on nearly $20 million. Mr. Firth replied and refused to answer. The Honourable Member for Carlton Trail Eagle Creek asked Mr. Firth to name his contacts in the various departments which provided GC Strategies with its 134 contracts. Again, Mr. Firth refused to answer. Now, one of the reasons that GC Strategy says that they were able to get these 134 contracts from the government is because of the reputation that they've built. And on their website, they have very detailed uh, referrals, recommendations from the most senior government officials without names attributed to them. So I asked Mr. Firth to name the individuals who allegedly provided these glowing testimonials who appear on their website, and Mr. Firth refused to answer. And his contempt for Parliament goes back not to weeks ago, but to his first appearance at committee on the Arrive scam nearly a year and a half ago. 
where he lied about knowing the secondary residence of a senior government official, now infamously saying it was a chalet, not a cottage, and even at his most recent uh, appearance at committee speaker, if it, uh, if it could bring you to laughter and not tears, he then said that it was a cabin. He lied about meeting government officials outside of government offices in that first appearance, and he lied about providing hospitality to government officials. And then he refused to return to committee to answer further questions, being summoned by the committee, um, and instead he decided to hide out. I'll note, Speaker, that when Mr. Firth first appeared at committee uh, nearly a year and a half ago, and he didn't provide some of these answers, he undertook to provide them immediately, that he would, he would give a return to the committee. Now, when he appeared at, at committee most recently, again under threat of arrest by House order, he said, well, I promise, and I quote, I promise, he said, that he would deliver the names of those government officials by the next morning at 9 a.m. Well, the committee was called to order at 10 a.m. the following morning, and the clerk confirmed and the chair reported that again, Mr. Firth had lied to committee, broken a promise while under oath. Now, the committee had to threaten Mr. Firth with arrest at the hands of the sergeant at arms if he continued to refuse, as I said, and it was only that threat that brought him out of hiding. And then he refused to answer straightforward questions that anyone with nothing to hide would, of course, uh, answer for. This is the kind of people that this Liberal Prime Minister is more than happy to hand over millions of dollars to for an app, but did no work. These are people who casually make a mockery of Canada's House of Commons, Canada's Parliament, and the oath that he took, a solemn oath that he took that morning at committee. There is no question that Parliament is the grand inquest of the nation. And it is to have unfettered right to send for people, papers, and documents. Meaning Parliament has the full authority to summon and compel the attendance and testimony in Canada, except His Majesty the King, his royal representatives, and to summon and compel the production of documents. The courts have clearly acknowledged the powers of the House as the grand inquest of the nation to inquire into any matter that it sees fit as part of the grand inquest of the nation. Parliamentary committees are not restricted in the scope of questions that they can pose to witnesses, and witnesses must answer all questions that are put to them. And this, this latest episode, this latest report from the Standing Committee on Government Operations is just the most recent development in a scandal that continues to grow and in, envelop this uh, government through the many investigations that have taken place and are ongoing by independent officers of parliament, parliamentary committees, and of course the national police force. The Auditor General, in a report that was issued against this government's wishes, every member of the government having voted to block the Auditor General from, from having investigated uh, GC strategies and the $60 million arrive scam, outlined the glaring lack of oversight and accountability in the procurement and contracting development of this failed app. And the Auditor General found that Canada Border Services Agency document, documentation, financial records and controls were so poor that she was unable to determine the price cost of the Arrive Can application. If you can imagine, the Auditor General, a general with an army of auditors unable to actually give precision on the price of this scandal that is about approximately $60 million. Now, using the information that was available, the Auditor General estimated the cost at at least $60 million. She found that the CBSA's disregard for policies, controls, and transparency in the contracting process restricted opportunities for competition and undermined value for money. She found that the agency, of course, didn't have documentation and 
why GC Strategies was selected through a non-competitive process in the first place, she doesn't know, and so far neither do Canadians. The Auditor General even found that Christian Firth and GC Strategies were able to write their own contract in one case that saw that two-man company awarded a $25 million contract. Now, the officials and IT firms working on Arrive Scam were playing fast and loose with security and privacy of Canadians' private information, biometric health information. In one of the original contracts, the government waived the requirement for workers to have the requisite top secret security clearance. GC Strategies did meet the requirements for another contract, didn't meet the requirements for another contract, and so the government didn't see a problem with that. The Auditor General was unable to find evidence of valid, valid security clearances for multiple workers on the app. It's no wonder Canadians were concerned from the very beginning. And it's no wonder that the Privacy Commissioner has launched his own investigation into the app for a second time, the first being related, of course, to the 10,000 Canadians falsely being sent into quarantine under threat of jail. That raises questions as to what exactly were government officials doing when all of this was going down. Well, they were too busy being wined and dined by contractors and even being treated to special whiskey tastings. They were more than happy to dole out millions of dollars in contracts that their hand-picked favorites, like GC Strategies, were looking for. They didn't care one bit about the value for money that Canadians were getting for their hard-earned tax dollars. And now they are scapegoating some and they're protecting others. They're lying. They're misleading parliamentary committees right alongside with GC Strategies' own Christian Firth. And the government has been trying to cover it up the entire way. When we have a situation in our country, a cost of a true crisis of the cost of living, record food bank usage, with millions of Canadians lining up at food banks in record numbers, thousands collaborating on best practices in being able to feed their families out of dumpsters, ten cities by the dozen in communities that just a few short years ago couldn't have imagined such a thing. All the while, this Liberal government has been allowing insiders to benefit to the tune of millions, to become millionaires off the hard-earned tax dollars of single mothers, of young families and of seniors. And what's the value for money that Canadians got for the millions that this Liberal Prime Minister awarded to these undeserving individuals like GC Strategies? Well, some Google searches, some LinkedIn searches, and a campaign to corrupt the procurement system and the public servants who oversaw the awarding of contracts. It's rot and corruption like this country hasn't seen in decades. Who was in charge? Because we haven't seen any minister stand up and take responsibility. Only after Canada's common sense conservatives pounded on the drum for a year and a half about the, the rot inside the Liberal government, has, have they finally started to make some, take some action and try and you know, confuse Canadians that, uh, that yo, you know, they're taking this seriously. The government who voted, every member of the Liberal government voted against the Auditor General actually investigating the $60 million boondoggle that, that is Arrive scam. But in what they described this week as the first wave of announcements in, in fraud in the procurement system, a $5 million in 
fraudulent contracting reported to the RCMP by the government? Well, it's the first wave. And you say, well, that's 5 million of 60 million. No. This is new. This is, this is new discovery of fraud now being investigated by the National Police Force. 